Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James. Today is a bit of a different episode. I was invited on to another podcast called SARD, who are a workforce and information technology company who wanted to find out more about Physician Associates. And they've produced this week's episode, so I thought it'd be great to share on my feed as well. So I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Sardisms, where we take great ideas and bring them together to have great conversations. In this episode, we speak with James Catton, who is a physician associate working in both general practice and acute medicine. He also hosts the PA podcast, which highlights the world of physician associates. Welcome. Well, cool. hello. Well, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we are um, an NHS owned or part owned software company based on workforce so we started doing revalidation for doctors but it, it sort of got born out of oxley so we just we created uh, which is a mental health trust um around near dartford okay. we we built some systems for them uh when i say we it was basically myself and my sister-in-law we built a couple of little applications for them and then we built some stuff and they just went oh this is great uh let's try and sell it around the country so we created a joint venture company and uh yeah it's just sort of growing up 10 years ago and it's just sort of grown and grown and now it's it's kind of like a sort of family not family business but it's got that kind of feel about it it's, it's only 25 people working here and uh-huh. um you know we're not really read in tooth and claw venture capitalist backed company we just go and build things and sell sell them around the nhs and build build software and um more recently we've been doing physician associate revalidation and physician associate um systems workforce management systems so i think we we did that at epsom and st helia and and then i think it's sort of snowboard from there Uh, and it's it's got a lot of interest actually there's a little merry band of pas that we've struck upon I'm like, ah, these people are really motivated and keen. And yep. uh, it's oh, sort of, there seems to be quite a good uh, culture and atmosphere around PAs. That's it's, good to hear. It's a pleasant surprise. <laughs> is, that, is that your experience? Or? I think most PAs personality type are somebody who is a little bit innovative. There is that flair of, we know we're something different. We're not a doctor. We are doing medicine in, in a different way so you probably do find that there's a bit of let's do something differently let's build something let's get behind a new idea just naturally by being a pa yeah it's got that slightly outsider mentality yeah yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> i mean outside i don't know how to explain it but yeah i think we all recognize yeah. that uh we're all building something new so yeah so it is new PA, when when did it come about, yeah. and uh, how did you how did you end up being a PA? So, in some respects, yes, it's very new profession in the grand history of the NHS. The original idea for PAs goes all the way back to the United States in the sixties. I think it was possibly the Vietnam War. I'd have to check my history books. But, uh, they had a whole bunch of field medics that were coming back from combat with quite a lot of skills, and they had a whole bunch of gaps in their workforce. Um, so they were like, well, how can we use these people who have medical knowledge and skills to train them? So Duke University in America created the first physician assistant program in the 60s. It's now exploded across the United States. There are hundreds of thousands of PAs. There are hundreds of PA courses churning out graduates. Um, and it's one of the best healthcare professions year, year after year ranked in America as one of the best uh, professions to work in. In the NHS, they a, looked at it in a sort of staff satisfaction sense, or in lots of ways, yeah. In terms of staff satisfaction, um, pay, uh, morale, job opportunities, uh, all those kind of uh, metrics that are used. So, yeah, it consistently comes out as a very positive and popular um, career path to take. In the NHS in the UK, somebody cottoned on to the idea about twenty years ago and said if the Americans are doing it, will it work over here? So they brought a couple of PAs over from the States and stuck them in, I want to say Staffordshire um, as the first pilot sites. So they brought a couple of PAs, put them into GP practices and said, will it work? And sort of evaluated that. 
got a bit of interest. It didn't really go anywhere for a few years. Um, some of the Americans went back home, so it didn't really get off the ground until the first course was started. Um, St. George's launched a course and the University of Wolverhampton launched a course mid 2000s, lasted a few years, had a few teething problems. Really, it's only since about 2014, 2015. Um, when the Royal College of Physicians came on board, created a faculty of physician associates within that Royal College, things have then really started to pick up pace. So we've gone from two or three universities initially offering courses. I think we're now up to 35. Um, in the space of, what did you say, 2015? Yeah, so. in about five or six years, it really mushroomed. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then in total numbers of PAs out there, did it... Difficult to put a very accurate figure on it. Um, currently, we're an unregistered, unregulated profession, um, but there is a managed voluntary register from the faculty. So they know of at least three and a half ish thousand PAs um, that are on that register. It's probably a few more that aren't on the register. GMC regulation coming in soon, it will be much easier to know exactly who the PAs are. Yeah. yeah. Certainly gone from a few hundred at the beginning of the decade to a few thousand where we are at the moment, churning out about a thousand a year from all of the university courses now. Wow. Okay. So growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, almost exponentially. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting to think about what the right number of PAs is and where it will top out. But certainly at the moment, I looked yesterday on the NHS jobs website, there are 260 odd jobs at the moment. And in my experience, demand for PAs is far outstripping the supply. So a good, a good thing for um, somebody interested in healthcare to, to look into and good yeah, prospects. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's a really good career, definitely. So how did you find it? So you, you must have been one of those early pioneers. How, how did you find yourself in this world? Yeah, so there were PAs before me, certainly, um, that had been qualified from the, the early days of the course. Uh, I'm in the east of England, and we, we really didn't have any at all. Um, that were training locally or working in the east of England. I was at university. I was doing a master's in food science and then wondering what comes next. I was also volunteering at the time with the ambulance service uh, as a first responder. So answering sort of 999 calls, going out, looking after people um, before the ambulance got there. And what I really enjoyed was that sort of patient facing role, that clinical work. I was like, how can I do more of this? I've got my science background. How can I have more of a clinical role? I thought about going to med school. Um, but honestly, the thought of being in my late twenties, going back to university, starting again, I don't know, financially, I couldn't really afford it. Um, so I just got lucky in as much as where I was doing my master's project in the lab, uh, they were launching the open evening for the PA course. I just happened to walk past it at the right time, stuck my head in the back, heard the, the sales pitch of the course and thought, ah, this is brilliant. It sounds like a really good way to get in, work clinically, use my science knowledge, and then applied and, and got into the first cohort. So you, you just happened to be walking past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those sort of fate it's moments. Sliding yeah. doors moments. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what does a PA do? In uh, what what is the difference between a PA and, a, and and doing that full medical course? Or? I have tried over the years to get a succinct answer to that, right. um, and I find the best way is not to try and compare myself to a doctor because yeah, probably does nobody any favors and doesn't win me any friends. Um, I tend to just be positive about what PAs can do. Um, yeah. so we are trained in much the same breadth of medical knowledge that you might get at medical school, but not to the same depth because we, our course is two years. Um, but we do try and cover a lot of this, the same common subjects that you would get in a medical curriculum. We are able to meet patients with any number of presenting symptoms, undifferentiated diagnoses. We are able to take their medical history. So ask all of the right questions about your presenting complaint, if that's chest pain or whatever it might be. Um, we're then trained to do the physical examination. So I might listen to your heart and listen to your chest, those kind of things. Um, if you're presenting with chest pain, I'll know which investigations I need to order. So the ECGs, the blood tests that you might need, I'll be able to interpret those results and act on the results of what we found to formulate a differential diagnosis and a management plan. We're not able to prescribe at the moment, um, although there is 
hopefully work afoot and, and plans to change that in the future once we become regulated. And we're not able to order x-rays and CT scans at the moment until we're regulated. Again, that will hopefully change. How, how long does it take to train to become a PA? What's the training process? So most physician associates who train at the moment will go in at a master's level course. So they have to have a pre-existing degree and it's an undergraduate degree, usually in healthcare or um, bioscience degrees. And that then gets you into the PA school, into the master's course. Um, and it's then two years to train, right. two full years. It's usually, you know, 45, 46 weeks of the year. We don't get those lovely undergraduate long summer holidays. Mm-hmm. Okay. That we're used to. <laughs> and it's pretty intense, is it? Yeah. Because <laughs> that, 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 from what you've just told me about what a PA's role is and what they can do, two years is a short time to learn all of that. Is yeah. That- it was certainly the most intense course I've done. Um, I've done other master's level study and it, certainly was the most intense, the most content to learn, um, but also really, really enjoyable. So it's about a 50-50 split. So there's the university time and then there's your placement time. Um, And on placement, you have to cover all of the breadth of the different specialties. So all of the medical specialties, the surgical specialties, you have to go into GP land, community services, so pediatrics, you have to cover all of the breadth of of different placement areas. Um, And then you get the corresponding lectures and talk content um, with that as well. well. And presumably that person starting that course could have very little knowledge of a hospital and its structure and what their specialties are. And Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. I'd, I'd never you know, right. stepped foot in a hospital. Right. So you, cause you came from a food science background. So I mean, just, just learning that alone, you know, having worked with the NHS for 15 years myself, it, there are still things I'm learning all the time just about literally how the days are structured and what groups do what and yeah. uh and and today what PA does I, I, <laughs> I think I had a vague idea but this is probably the most I've ever looked into it I'd never sent a pager uh, until I started working in the NHS at 28 I had no idea what that technology was and how to use it so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a great uh, that's so not a all, good thing. There's all sorts of yeah. I didn't know what a registrar really was. There's loads of stuff to work out about just being in the hospital, as well as the medicine that you're trying to learn as well. So. Yeah, that sounds excellent. And so you created a podcast about for PAs. What what um, drove you to do that? What inspired you to create a podcast? And how's that gone? <laughs> I just like the sound of my own voice. Um, <laughs> Don't, I did. <laughs> no, I was recognizing uh, after a few years of practicing as a PA, I'd found my feet a little bit. I felt, you know, more sure of, of my role and what I was being asked to do in my area. And I wasn't sure whether I liked hospital medicine or if I liked general practice more. So my first job, I took two jobs. I split my week, two days a week in general practice and two days a week in the hospital. And after a year or so, I was like, this is cool. I like it both. We'll keep both going. But I started to wonder what other PAs who were coming after me were doing um, and how that was evolving across the country. So I started reaching out to other PAs, just having a chat with them, seeing what was going on. And I thought, actually, this is probably of interest to other people. Um, I was on a course about sort of leadership skills and and that kind of um, stuff. And it just sort of, there were about 30 other PAs on that course and it just started an idea together that we had and I was like actually I might follow through on that and they were all like yeah yeah that'd be really cool we'd we'd like to hear what other PAs are up to so uh, with their encouragement started it about 18 months ago now and and try to put out an episode most weeks. I guess with such a young profession and such a new career path it's probably changing and adapting very quickly as you go through, I mean, you mentioned that it's seven years since the um, Royal College of Physicians created the, did they create the faculty, did you say, seven years ago? Yeah, so within that time, it, I'm, I'm sure it must be changing. Phenomenal, uh, yeah. Yeah, phenomenally. You, you don't have the, what is it, thousand, no, what was their birthday? 500 years, I think it is, the Royal College of Physicians. So it's a bit of, <laughs> a bit more stabilised. Yeah, they've, they've certainly got a, le- a head start on us. Um, it's interesting when the more I talk about PAs, I, I talk to American PAs and there, there was an f- episode of the podcast I did around the history of the physician associate profession. 
mm. and how they got started in the 60s, some of the teething problems they have, very similar to what we have in the UK. But even talking to other professions that are now regulated and, and everyone knows what a physiotherapist is or what a paramedic is, mm. if you go back into the history of those professions, it's very similar in terms of some of the stumbling blocks that they had to get over in terms of regulation and then moving on to prescribing rights and those kind of things. So it feels like slow progress when you're a PA and you want everything to happen now, but mm. actually comparing to other professions, we're probably going at the right speed. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there's presumably a lack of uh, what I would call in, in my world, a, a sort of lack of market recognition of what, what it is the PA has, has to offer. So if you're going out there seeking a job, the people that you who you'd be useful to don't necessarily have a concept of the of the fact that you would be useful to them, or even that that career or that option exists to them. I mean, we, we find that sometimes when we're building technology, that you'll you'll come up with a good idea for a product or a service, and it's just that they don't, you know, the the people you're selling it to don't necessarily understand that concept. So you you not only have to sell the product you have to sell even the get them to understand what it is that that market even is <laughs> i'm not, not explaining it very well but market recognition is not a term i'd heard before but it encapsulates exactly yeah so part of my role now is working as a physician associate ambassador so uh, health education england pay me one day a week to work as a pa ambassador and that involves working in my local system so around suffolk and northeast essex and exactly some of it is what you've just described is going to GPs or hospital consultants, service managers and going, have you thought about a PA? I notice you've got this permanent job advert out that you've not been able to fill. Would a PA fit the role that you're trying to do? Could they do some of the work that you need? Would you, do you know about PAs? Once you know about PAs, mm. do you want one? It's some of it is, is winning over the hearts and minds um, mm. and, and just explaining that we exist and that we're there and what we can do. To help. There was one analogy that was given to me early on. I don't know if you agree with this, but it was the sort of police community support officer sort of set up where, you know, obviously being a police, police man, uh, a woman requires a lot of regulatory training and a lot of uh, regulatory hoops to jump through, but probably a significant proportion of that work is actually just sort of day-to-day -day operational and you can get someone to do, you know, 90% of that same work and and hopefully free up their time it, for both of you. Yeah, I'm very reticent to ever compare myself and say I, you know, try and create an equivalency. Um, the reason I made that face when you were talking about PCSOs is I remember some of the headlines that were in around when PCSOs were introduced around, you know, cut rate mm. policemen, police on the cheap. Uh, yeah, second class service. It's exactly some of the headlines that you see reported around physician associates. We are doctors on the cheap. We are second rate and mm. clinicians of that, that kind of. And if you ever go on social media, it, it, there's always some negative comments um, that you can find on Twitter and those things about physician associates being compared to doctors, and that kind of breeds resentment. And so, yeah, it's just interesting that you've, yeah. It, whenever you try to introduce a new part of the workforce. Yeah. I think I problems. remember a similar thing when teaching assistants became more common in classrooms as well. And, you, you know, I've got two kids and I don't think they've ever been in a class where I didn't have a teaching assistant. And yet it's a long while ago now, but I don't recall us ever having teaching assistants when I was at school. Maybe we did, but I, I, I don't remember them. <laughs> I can remember a education minister of a government gone by who described teaching assistants as pig ignorant peasants. So oh. part of it is getting over that resentment and explaining what we can do um, in a positive way and not falling into the trap of falling into the arguments about them versus us. And, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a very healthy mindset. <laughs> You've clearly thought about this uh, a lot. So what were the pitfalls that the uh, American, your American colleagues faced that you're, you're hitting over here? What, is so it that the political sort of concept or is it uh, more operational? A little bit of both. I, I think I wouldn't want to talk on behalf of, of any of the American colleagues, but I think from what they've told me, part of it is 
establishing the profession there's always the old guard who think we just need more doctors we just need to train more doctors why don't you go to medical school uh, those kind of people part of it is also difficult to compare with the states obviously their system is very different private healthcare mm. um, so the regulations are very different even state to state some PAs have very different regulations in terms of what they can and can't do in terms of their scope of practice um, but once they've got their, their you know they had their national re- recognition and regulation sorted um, by and large they're all able to prescribe with some differences in terms of mm. controlled drugs is this a four nations thing to uh, Scotland what in the UK right. Yeah. Yes, there are physician associates uh, trained in all four nations, um, predominantly in England. There's one course in Scotland, I think, only Aberdeen, maybe two in Wales, and one in Northern Ireland that I'm aware of. So there are physician associates coming across um, all parts of the UK, but at the moment are still mainly in clusters around the larger university areas, so London, Birmingham. Uh, where you have the majority of the courses. What have you learned as a PA? What surprised you? What didn't you think was going to be the case? Oh, so much. I never, ever thought I'd have a podcast. Um, Mm. I never, ever thought I'd be inviting the head of the GMC to talk to me or the head of Health Education England. It's been a fantastic way to network. It turns out I have quite an interest in workforce planning, workforce design, a bit of innovation, I think being a PA is quite innovative and that really mm. appeals to me. Um, so there's a whole branch of sort of my career that seems to be going into leadership and promotion of the profession and um, creating new things that haven't existed for PAs in the past, um, like PA academies, supervision, um, placement years, those kind of things that we're all been working on in my patch in Suffolk. So. Mm-hmm. I assumed I was going to go in and just be clinical five days a week, but actually I really love doing that kind of service change delivery workforce stuff. I also really, really like teaching, um, which I didn't know until I started having PA students come in the years after me. Um, They ask really great questions that I don't always know the answer to, and it makes me learn new stuff every time I teach um, students. It's been really good. And I've done sort of a PG cert in med ed now and, looking to do more teaching in the future. So yeah. that surprised me as well. There are any questions you think I should ask you? What don't people ask you that they should? What, what are you passionate about? Interesting question. About? I think there's something to be said around how the profession might develop um, and where it might go, um, whether we want professional recognition the same as the doctors and exams and stuff that follow. Um, and career frameworks. Um, whether you want it, so whether it's a good thing for PAs. As you say, when, I mean, being a sort of innovative profession, one of the benefits you've got uh, as we do in software development is that actually being on software development is unregulated, but it also means that you can, <laughs> you can do <laughs> what you like, essentially, and you can, you can be very dynamic about how you go about things without anyone sort of breathing down your neck and telling you, you know, you're not allowed to do it this way because this is the way we've always done it. I think that's true of physician associates as well, actually. That was part of what appealed to me going in as one of the first PAs to train. There isn't a set career framework structure of what you're supposed to follow. The doctors have established that for themselves over generations. And it's very much, you go to medical school, you do your foundation training. Once you've qualified medical school, you then pick a specialty you do your run through until you're a consultant or a GP mm. and you you're on that path. Once you're on the cardiology path, it's very difficult for you to change if you decide you wanted to. PAs are not boxed in into that way. Some of my colleagues see that as a disadvantage and really want a career pathway and really want a structure. And they know that their specialism is respiratory medicine. So they really mm. want the exams and the qualifications after their name to go to go with that to prove their competence in that area. For me, I really love the flexibility that comes with being a PA. There's very, very few doctors I've ever heard of who are able to work in both hospital medicine and GP, you know, half their week in each. Very difficult for a doctor to establish that um, sort of career and, and that contract with the employers. 
we're all moving into integrated care systems across the NHS. And one of the best ways to integrate things is to integrate the people that run the systems. So mm. I work in GP. I'm able to then, if I need to refer a patient into the acute medical unit where I also work, I'll pick up the phone. I'll say hello to my colleague who will recognize my voice. So I'll give them the, the patient handover. They know it's a sensible one. I know what their service is. So I know I'm not going to miss refer or get it wrong. Um, and quite often I'll go in and do the ward round on the next day and I'll see my patient again. And I'll be like, right, I know all about this patient. I can tell you all about them. Mm. I've seen them in general practice. I did a home visit on them last month and I know everything about them. So I can present that to the consultant on the ward round. And then I'll write mm. a discharge letter probably from the hospital back to myself at GP and, and I'll know what tasks need following up. So there's a lot of good integration and blue sky thinking that you can do as a PA. Um, mm. It's not perhaps open to or as easy for doctors to do. I can see in the future, PAs are probably going to have a specialist area. So you might be a PA in diabetes um, care in the hospital, working with the nurse specialists and consultants in diabetes care of patients in the hospital. But there's no reason why you couldn't do two or three days as the diabetes lead for patients in your GP practice. And then you can upskill your GP colleagues you work with in diabetes care. You can take on the lead role for looking after all those patients and on their books um, and really, you know, make sure that everything is to the best that it can be for your patient care. So I can see a lot of hybrid working models and, and they're coming out already. Um, COPD and there's a, a PA who's working across respiratory medicine and then leading on COPD prevent ad, admissions prevention in the community. Um, there's another PA who works in elderly medicine and then is working on the care home reviews for their GP practice. Um, so they're really bringing, you know, tying things together yeah. where we've previously been in silos. And, you know, yeah, and presumably they're, they're freer to do that, they're more liberty to to take these strands that uh, yeah. and, and bring them together and make it a... Yeah, it's, I think it's quite difficult for doctors to achieve that because you're either a GP and that's what you're training to do in your training pathway, and then you're, you're a GP mm. or you're a hospital doctor, and it's very difficult to sometimes cross over and there's a lot of good skills and learning that can happen so you're in a kind of race with the regulation to make sure that you discover what works before it gets pinned down yeah i imagine as these things go on it will there will be post exam qualifications and certain things you have to do to become a pa in cardiology you must have passed this exam or, or x y yeah. and i do worry that that's to the detriment of the profession sometimes because if I decide I want to up sticks and move halfway across the country tomorrow, in theory, I could take a job as a PA in basically anything and start from the bottom and start learning again. Mm. Um, and I worry about boxing ourselves into certain categories where I could only work if I had a certain qualification. Yeah. It's a, it's a difficult thing to balance because I can understand the, the desire on both sides to have it, you know, regulated to some extent because it also fits with that concept of you know market recognition or however you want to uh, yeah. profession recognition that um people know what it is and the fact is that once it is a bit more regulated and people go ah oh, you're one of these people who does this thing <laughs> yeah whereas if, if you're more free to you know you know work and cop d and then also do prevention that's a sort of nebulous, you're, you're changing the, the career and uh, the, the structure of it as you as you go. It reminds me a bit of the, um, there was like a university campus where they were putting in some pathways and instead of putting the paths in, have you ever heard of this, this thing? Um, instead yeah. of putting the pedestrian walkways in and actually concreting them down, what they did is they just, they put grass everywhere and um and then they just looked to see where people walked and where they eroded the grass and then they put the paths down <laughs> and i think sometimes with with a new profession like this you you need to make sure that you're giving people an opportunity to work out actually what the structure of a pa profession looks like before you start putting the slabs down and saying okay this is the pathway this is the route through so you're you're the I people like treading that. treading the dust, <laughs> making making Thinking the dusty tracks. pathways, making the tracks. Um, so that those who come after um, know where to lay the the sort of 
the more solid slabs down behind. I think as well, there's a recognition of not wanting to reinvent the wheel so that you end up with another wheel. Like we have the doctor's profession, which is mm. incredibly <laughs> crucial and necessary. And the training that they do is is very important to produce a very good doctors at the end of it. We're not trying to be doctors and we shouldn't be trying to, I guess, follow in their footsteps all of the way. Um, otherwise, what's the difference in the profession? Why bother? Mm. So we have to recognise that PAs are not doctors and we should retain our own unique identity. And that might be some flexibility is one of the unique selling points of what a PA is. We saw it in the COVID pandemic. Uh, everybody got reassigned and re and moved around into areas that they weren't necessarily used to clinically. So we were having dermatology doctors um, that obviously so their outpatient work was stopped for a while and um, were coming in to help on the wards um, but they were very good at dermatology but obviously hadn't been in general medical settings for a while so perhaps one of the unique selling points of a PA is that they retain a sort of broad general knowledge and don't ever specialise too much so that mm. when the next problem happens you're able as a workforce to pick them up and shunt them yeah. where they need to go and yet if you were regulating PAs I think you've already got this kind of frame of reference with the doctors, as you say, for specialization, and yet a lack of specialization may be a feature. There, there are no real generalists in the hospital anymore. Uh, you could argue maybe that a pediatrician is a generalist in, in child's health, but even then you get subspecialized pediatric doctors. And so it's very difficult to retain generalist skills. Maybe I'm, I'm speaking out of turn because it's not my area of knowledge in terms of doctors and their specialism but it seems to me that there are very few generalists and yeah perhaps PAs can fill that area I've always liked the idea of sort of slightly larger teams working together I was struck the other day when I went to the dentist and the relationship between a dentist and a dental nurse and how liberating I think that was for both sides about their kind of role in that teamwork and the comparison I had between that and uh, going to GP surgery, where they didn't have they didn't have someone who who was working alongside them, you know, I don't mean to dismiss the like dental nurses' work as just purely administrative, but there was that whole administrative role of could you make sure the next the next patients ready to come through or the, the records are on. And, and and there's also this sort of, you know, enough clinical knowledge as well from a dental nurse about what a dentist is doing that they can talk to each other about things. And just just that idea of, I would say a bit strange really that the GP, for, for example, tends to sit on their own, <laughs> you know, without a kind of secondary input or somebody who's who can assist and, or, or a nurse even or, or any anyone working in a sort of profession on their own um just having someone who's got a slightly different role even provides that opportunity for there to be that conversation and sparring and sort of intellectual tennis about the thing you're working on and throwing ideas around and oh you've yeah you've i mean you've hit the nail on the head as far as i'm concerned the clues in the name of our profession physician associate it's that association that we have with a consultant um or a gp or whoever we work with it's that association that we build up over years because we don't rotate so pas are a permanent member of the team that they work in whereas the doctors for their training have to move departments mm. every few months move hospitals basically every year so they come in for a few months and learn stuff uh, as soon as they're sort of up to speed and, and know what they're doing and comfortable and know how the process works, off they go to the next one. PAs are a permanent member of the team. We don't rotate. We stay in place. So we build that association with our consultants. We know exactly what they're going to want on the ward round. We know what the plans are often for patients that we see day in presentations that we see quite commonly. We know when our patients are sick and they come back to the service. We know what worked for them last time. We know their history. Um, we know how to look after them in GP land. We know how to do the referrals correctly and, and how all of that kind of system stuff in the reception works. And we just sort of build and retain that institutional knowledge over mm. a period of time. So you get efficiency, you get continuity in care um, that is really important and really valuable in that association between the, the PA and their senior. Well, I'm sold. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> um, you you mentioned you you have a food science background. Does that come into play? Anything? Any learnings from your world in food science? Or? Not as much as I'd like it to. Uh, I'm still. Yeah, I've been qualified four years, so I still count myself as pretty junior um, mm. in terms of the team. What I'd like to do more of as I get mastering the basics and, and a firmer footing and then I can move on, um, I'd like to do more sort of preventative work. Um, mm. So talking to people about diet and exercise and sort of preventing disease in the first place rather than just treating it when something goes wrong. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely a big role for sort of gut health in terms of IBS symptoms and those kind of things, but also linked to yeah. mental health problems, anxieties. Yeah. Sorry, this is probably uh, way off topic in terms of PA stuff, but I am just curious. What 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 does a food scientist do? What what what's a food scientist? <laughs> uh, so I you weren't expecting that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long curious. time since I did my master's project. <laughs> I use the term in as much as uh, the research projects that I was doing for my master's uh, mm. degree was in food. So we were looking at certain cell signaling pathways and whether particular compounds in foods could stimulate those pathways. It was all to do with the Mediterranean diet, and we were epidemiologically noticing that people who follow that sort of Mediterranean diet were there's far fewer instances of heart disease. Right, so okay. Trying to this is a Mel Hotra, isn't it? The Piopi diet guy? Is that yeah. I've been out of the no. field for a while. I'm not sure on that one. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, so we were looking at can this chemical cause this cell signaling pathway to do mm. a thing? Um, and whether that was particularly active and that could be the reason why people's hearts are healthier as a result of what they eat. Turns out looking at several different cell signaling pathways, none of them were the ones that I was looking at. So oh, that's why I fell out of a bit of love of doing this the science research and wanted more of a clinical job. So. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. It's, uh, it's a slow search through that sort of area of science, isn't it? I think. That's not to say, so I've, I've just made a podcast episode with a PA on the Physician Associate podcast who is in clinical research um, in Old Hay Hospital, so one of the children's specialist mm -hmm. hospitals. So there are PAs who are doing clinical research as well out there and more power to them because... I'm not sure I could do it anymore. <laughs> okay. Just have one last question we always ask. If you had one message to our listeners, what would it be? If you have an interest in clinical science and medicine and think the physician associate profession is of interest, by all means, have a Google um, look at the Faculty of PA's website. You can check out my podcast to find out more about what a PA does. You might also come across a PA next time you go to your GP practice as a patient. Um, you might not be seen by a GP. It might be a PA. It might be a physio or a paramedic or a nurse who's seeing you. Um, so don't be surprised, I think, if you start seeing PAs popping up more and more across the NHS in the future. I've really, it's been really interesting finding out about what PAs do, particularly that 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 dental nurse, dentist thing that I, that I spotted when I went to the dentist and... It has always struck me that that bit of medicine seems to be missing. That association, the close pairing, the partnership working that I see. You know, in technology and software, there's this pair programming principle where I don't know how widely known it's out, known outside of software, but there's this thing called pair programming where you actually sit down and code together. And you think, why would you do that? Because you've only got one keyboard and one screen. Like, surely that's going to half your work rate. But it really doesn't. It's it's um you, you get you, better quality outcome at the end of it, don't you? Yeah, we well, learn off of each other. Uh, you you know, and even when you're sitting there passively, um, you can you can see sort of things and have ideas about things and go, yeah. oh, and you you spar off of each other and you you bring new things to each other's work. And it, it it's actually. Uh, and the same with kind of code reviews, which I guess are probably a bit like uh, sort of supervision sessions where you're going back through case case reviews. You know, you do code code reviews, and it's a similar sort of concept where you've got two engineers who are looking at each other's work and how how it might improve. 
And uh, yeah, so it's really, it's been really interesting to learn about that. And it, it sounds like a really positive move forward for, for the NHS and medicine in general in the UK. More power to your, to your PA elbows. <laughs> Sounds great. I was thinking about the nursing profession and how that's changed. A kind of a different path into doing that clinical work that might still be open to people. I was just thinking, my mum, my mum was a nurse for um, about 30 years and, you know, she left school. She didn't do A-levels, she did O-levels, left school, didn't do a degree, you know, because, um, because that was the era, she, you know, she was child of, child of the sixties, you were, went into work in the sixties, you know, you didn't, you didn't need to do these things. She just turned up to Thomas Cook as she did and start working there. And it was a, a different era. Um, but boy, she was a natural born nurse. And I often wonder how, you, you know, her interest in, in caring for people and, uh, caring, but also an interest in medicine and um, how she would have done that in a modern era. And I think it would actually be in a modern era. It sounds like she'd be more likely to go down the PA route. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> so Project Millennium, I think it was called around the. Yeah, she was a Project Two Thousand, Project Two Thousand nurse. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So when it became a degree entry profession, I do have some concerns of who did that put off becoming a nurse. There are probably very good people out there who would be very good nurses, but never saw themselves as, as academically able to go to university and or financially able to go to university. And it may have stopped them going to become a nurse. They are now introducing a nursing associate profession, mm. which is not degree entry. Um, it's more of an apprenticeship style way of learning. So it's going back to the old way of becoming a nurse um, uh, so they're a sort of sister profession to the physician associate profession. Mm. They're not a registered nurse. They're not fully qualified to the same extent, but they can do a lot of the same work um, that a registered nurse can do um, as well. So reinventing the wheel, coming back to the same ideas. <laughs> mm. Well, it's interesting. Thank you, James. Pleasure. Thank you to all our listeners who tuned in to today's episode of Sardisms. Follow James's podcast about physician associates on Twitter at PA Podcast UK. You can find out more about Sard by visiting sardjv.co.uk or send us a tweet on Twitter at sardjv and use hashtag Sardisms. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you.